In the previous lectures, we discussed a lot about several measurements, and now we even included left atrial strain imaging in patients in indeterminate situations. We also strive the topic of diastolic dysfunction and left ventricular strain and in this lecture we will discuss the importance of LV strain in diastolic dysfunction. In this first image you have a patient with a reduction in basal strain but overall a normal global longitudinal strain. The global strain, so the GS, is minus 20.5%. Overall, everything below minus 18, so minus 19, minus 20, minus 21, and so on, is normal. Minus 16 to minus 18 is borderline, and below minus 16 is definitely an abnormal global longitudinal strain of the left ventricle. But why would we measure the LV strain in diastolic dysfunction? Well, in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, it correlates with the natriuretic peptides, the BNP, also with the fibrosis of the heart, with survival, hospitalizations, and of course, with diastolic dysfunction as well. So the lower the LV strain, the worse diastolic function will be and elevated filling pressures are more likely. Furthermore, in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, you will have a reduction in left ventricular strain in the early stages, especially of HEFPEF, so the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, where you have the good ejection fraction but the bad strain. So the cutoff here would be minus 15. So if below minus 15, the outcomes of the patient with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is also worse. Let us try and evaluate the patient. We have here a patient with a thickened myocardium, but a normal left ventricular ejection fraction. We do see that ejection fraction is approximately 55%, so normal. If you take a look at the right ventricle, it's not dilated. So the main problem here, what we see is that the left ventricle has a thickened myocardium. Now we have to take a look at the LV strain. The global longitudinal strain is minus 15.1%. So it's very borderline to minus 15. The basal strain again is reduced to a reduction in strain at the lighter red colors. It's in between minus 11 in the inferior regions, whereas in the anterior and lateral regions, it's approximately minus five, minus six. There is this so-called apical sparing. It is the sparing or the normal function of left ventricular strain of the longitudinal function of the left ventricle. In the apical regions, you see normal values or the darker red colors. In between red or reddish colors is just the gradient. So the basal segments, they have a reduced function. The apical segments do seem to work normally or have a normal longitudinal function. Now we have to assess diastolic dysfunction. And when we take a look at E to E prime, so the ratio on the left hand side, you see the E prime septal. It's 6.5 centimeters per second, which is borderline, but actually normal. On the right hand side, you see the E prime lateral, 8 centimeters per second, which is reduced. The E velocity is above 50 centimeters per second. So we do not automatically have a diastolic dysfunction grade one, but we have to think more and continue our measurements. And in this case, the E to E prime ratio is below 14, so it's normal. Now let's take a look at the left atrium. As you can see already in the smaller parts or the smaller loops, the left atrium is definitely enlarged. You have a left atrial volume overall of 78 milliliters, which in this patient equals 41 milliliters per square meter. So it's definitely an enlarged left atrium. So we have now one negative criterion, the E to E prime ratio, but one positive criterion, the volumetric index. If you continue to TR, TR was simply not possible to measure in this patient. Now we have the situation where the mitral valve inflow signal did show an E of above 50 centimeters, even though the E2 ratio was below 0.8. We evaluated the three criteria, but we only had the E2 E prime ratio, which is below 14, namely 8.5. But we did have the left atrium volume index about 34 milliliters per square meter. It was 41 milliliters per square meter, so definitely pathological. So now it is indeterminate. We do not know if filling pressures are elevated. We do not know if it is diastolic dysfunction grade 1 with normal filling pressures or diastolic dysfunction grade 2 with likely elevated filling pressures. As we have discussed previously, we can use left atrial strain and left atrial function. We have to look at two measurements, the pulse the peak atrial longitudinal strain, and the PAX, the peak atrial contraction strain. 
If we do that and apply those measurements, you already probably have seen it before, we have a pulse. You simply can see it over here as well. At the tip of the curve, the pulse is approximately 30%. So that's reduced, but points us towards normal filling pressures. And the pux is 19%. So it also points towards normal filling pressures. If we take a look at the slide we have seen before, the, the diastolic dysfunction in case of a pulse below 18% or below 16% might show elevated filling pressures also in patients with a preserved ejection fraction. And the pux below 8% denotes elevated filling pressures. In this case, we have a pulse way above 18% and the pux definitely above 14% and the PAX above 14% in patients with a normal left ventricular function, or in this case a global longitudinal strain of minus 18, identifies normal filling pressure. Still, we know that the global longitudinal strain was reduced, the ejection fraction was normal, but if you look at all those measurements and if you combine it, we are relatively sure that in this case the filling pressures might be normal. As you can see in this example, the diastolic dysfunction is a puzzle and we have to put together all the puzzle pieces and left atrial strain with the knowledge we have from the literature currently existing can help us to identify normal filling pressures. Also in patients with a reduced global longitudinal strain but with a preserved ejection fraction. Still, the more values we have to keep in mind, the more complicated it will be in this situation. It was a rather special situation, but still with the help of left atrial strain, even though global longitudinal strain is reduced, we can be quite sure that filling pressures are normal with the measurements of the peak atrial strain and the peak atrial contraction strain. To continue the summary, in the next lecture, we will discuss the therapy of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction.